ECDC On Air, the podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Hello, welcome and thanks for tuning in to ECDC On Air, the podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. I'm your host, Lee, recording from my headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden. Today, if you're listening on Friday 1st of December, is World AIDS Day. Now in its 35th year, World AIDS Day started off as the very first International Day of Global Health all the way back in 1988. Each year, ECDC, together with the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe, put together a surveillance report to see how the numbers of HIV and AIDS diagnoses have changed and highlight the latest developments, challenges, and achievements in the European region. Today, we are joined by Anastasia Farris, Principal Expert in Communicable Diseases, to discuss the report and to get a better understanding of the overall picture of HIV in Europe and whether Europe is on track to meet the Sustainable Development Goals to end AIDS by 2030. So today we're joined by Anastasia Farris, Principal Expert in Communicable Diseases. Uh, Anastasia, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you. So before we begin, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you came to ECDC and what, what your principal work here is? Sure. Um, I've been at ECDC since 2011, so it's been about 12 years now. And um, I've worked the entire time at ECDC, mostly on the topic of bloodborne infections, so HIV and uh, a bit of hepatitis. And over time, was able to work a bit on COVID during the pandemic. And I'm now working with a group that focuses on HIV and hepatitis, but also STIs and uh, tuberculosis. Okay. So, well, today we're going to be talking about World AIDS Day, which is today, December 1st. ECDC and WHO have put together a surveillance report for 2023 using 2022 data. Could you tell us a little bit about this report and what it's pointing out to us in terms of HIV and AIDS in Europe? So we work together to look at all the most recent numbers on people who are diagnosed with HIV from all of the countries across the WHO European region. So that's 53 countries. We uh, focus on the part of the EU. So we write that chapter, but we collaborate on this report. And um, the latest data that goes through 2022 shows us that the picture is becoming a little more complicated. So what we'd seen prior to 2022 is that in the EU, we kind of had a downward trend. Things were moving in a good direction, uh, fewer diagnoses, fewer infections, we thought, each year. And then we saw an increase in 2022 when comparing it to the 2021 data by about 30%. And so surveillance people, of course, whenever there's a spike or an increase, you start to worry. But we also know from talking to countries that a lot of this was due to catch up um, of cases after COVID. So cases that um, testing that wasn't happening during the lockdowns then was resumed or cases that had been diagnosed hadn't been reported, so that we're catching up on the paperwork. Um, And then we also know that the Ukraine crisis happened in 2022, and so a lot of refugees fled from Ukraine and ended up in EU countries. And so many of these people had a known HIV diagnosis, but they were re-registered when they arrived in the EU. Okay, so there's quite a mixed picture then. So in one sense, there are more cases, but we're also testing more to be able to see a fuller picture. Yeah. And that's sometimes complicated news to communicate. Is the situation getting better or worse when you see the line going up? But um, we think for the most part, the, we're not so worried that there's a, many, many new infections happening. But the infections that we know are occurring do remain in really vulnerable groups, in people who inject drugs, in um, a lot of cases in men who have sex with men or gay men and, and, and other men who have sex with men, and in migrant populations, which can in some parts of the region be groups that are more stigmatized or have difficulty accessing health services. With more and more people finding out that they have HIV, how are we making sure that there are accurate records being kept? And obviously you mentioned with people moving, so make, uh, you know, with previous diagnoses and, and whatnot. But, and how does this affect the ways that we try to prevent spread in general? Yeah, it is really important. I mean, HIV is now more or less a chronic disease. Um, it's something that you live with, of course, your whole life after being diagnosed. If you get good treatment, you can live a really healthy and a really long life. But that means that if, as you move, as anyone would with hypertension or diabetes or any kind of chronic condition, you need to receive health care wherever you're living. And so then you need to access health services. And in that case, you know, someone would be re-registered as an HIV diagnosis. So that's very important. But what we also see is that in some cases, 
maybe a person is maybe not bringing their health records with them and so then they're re-diagnosed or they need to restart from scratch or maybe they HIV care isn't maybe on the top of their priority list in a situation for example of a refugee crisis and then they may stop a treatment for a period of time and then need to be sort of like redetected or re-engaged in care um, later on. Is it a case that there are people that have moved that don't know they have HIV and that they're being caught later in this surveillance? Yeah, definitely. We see a lot of late diagnosis in some populations of migrants. The highest proportions are in people who have migrated from sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia, for example. A lot of those cases tend to be in um, adults who have contracted HIV through heterosexual transmission and um, tend to be a bit older. And so sometimes maybe just aren't, we don't think to offer them HIV testing, or maybe they're not linked into health services. And so that is a problem because if you're diagnosed late, you tend to have more health issues and might end up even, you know, at risk of being hospitalized or dying. And so it's really important to try to diagnose people earlier through offering better testing. Okay. So how are European countries changing the way they approach testing and treatment for specific groups? Like, so you mentioned migrants, men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs. They're very, very disparate groups, and obviously one set of messages doesn't necessarily work for another group. How can countries address that? The countries that are doing this in the best way are not putting the onus of responsibility only on the individuals to seek testing, but they're really making testing available in a lot of ways in places that people who would need testing are. So they're doing community testing, and we see this has expanded a lot in Europe in the past 10 years, where community organizations, checkpoints, clinics for gay men, are offering testing. Often it's um, organized by a lay health provider, so it doesn't even need to be a doctor or a nurse in a lot of countries. And this works really, really well. But we also see really successful programs in pharmacies, in drug services, and through a variety of, of those types of places in the community. But also in health services, what's worked extremely well in some countries is to have kind of routine pop-ups in healthcare records which say, oh, this person is here with TB might you consider an HIV test? So it makes it as part of routine care for healthcare providers who are really busy. They have a lot of things on their minds and a lot of uh, work to do, that it's easy and that it's just kind of a routine part of the testing. And so this is sometimes called indicator condition testing, things that are associated with HIV that um, a reminder be, be pop up and help healthcare workers to yeah, initiate that and, um, and make it happen. So ECDC in September released some reports on stigma and HIV. Mm -hmm. And obviously now we're talking again, you know, sort of uh, men who have sex with men, migrants, people who inject drugs. These are all also different groups that have a certain amount of stigma around them. So what are some of the health challenges that we're facing in making sure that everyone, all of these people can get the health services that they need? Yeah, we have had stigma on our radar for a really long time. And it is one of these high level UN AIDS indicators of things that we need to tackle in order to reach the HIV targets by 2030. But um, stigma has been notoriously difficult to measure. And there's been a lot of discussion across our the European countries that we work with that, oh, it must operate really differently. We can't possibly harmonize and all do the same survey. But actually, a colleague of ours here at, at ECDC, together with AIDS Action Europe and the European AIDS Treatment Group, did a project anyway and said, let's try this. And they were really successful in getting a a lot of people living with HIV to respond to the same questions across languages. And we saw a lot more stigma than we'd expected. That was, you know, in the last year, one in six people had not told a healthcare provider about, or they were afraid to seek healthcare because of their HIV status. And we'd expected maybe to see a bit less recent stigma that we expected, you know, we'd see more, maybe it happened a long time ago. But to see so much stigma happening in the last year was surprising to us and quite concerning because we know it makes people less likely to disclose their HIV status to people to receive social support, to healthcare providers to receive the right care that they need, or people who don't know their HIV status might not seek testing. So for all of these reasons, it's a big issue. And so now we're doing a survey together with the European AIDS Clinical Society to look at healthcare provider related stigma. And those results should be available in 2024, kind of early on, where we can then use that to guide programs where we'll look at what are the health sectors that we need to address for training to you know do a better job so that those healthcare providers can accept and yeah basically meet people who maybe have to discuss um, their HIV risk or HIV status. How are European countries working together to share information to deal with the challenges? Obviously, you've mentioned that the WHO region is quite large, but if we're just talking about the EU and the EEA, is there a, a good method of sharing information about how best to deal with disparate communities or how to get messaging out and things like that? Like, 
Is it working together well or is there vastly different things happening across the region? This has been a strength in Europe for sure. And I've worked in different regions of the world before coming to work at ECDC. And I think that Europe is really strong in, um, we have networks through ECDC, for example, where we harmonize and discuss things like surveillance of HIV, as well as monitoring of HIV. But we also have really strong community organizations and networks through organizations like AIDS Action Europe and the European AIDS Treatment Group, where they're sort of umbrella organizations of a lot of community NGOs. And um, that works really well to share information. There have been some really successful EU projects that have pulled together testing, for example, what are good practices here on HIV testing? How can we translate that to another country? We've seen that also joint actions that have been funded by the European Commission on arm reduction on uh, MSM and internet surveys. And so there's a lot of really good examples of this happening. In places where fewer people are getting HIV, what do you think has contributed to the improvement? How are countries keeping up with progress while dealing with new challenges? The places that are seeing a real reduction are doing a really good job of preventing HIV. Those are the countries that have pretty comprehensive sexual health services and PrEP programs, so pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. They're making it available to people. As soon as they find an HIV diagnosis, they're very quickly linking those cases to care, starting them on care within days normally, and then supporting adherence. The countries that have seen a reduction have good surveillance systems to measure the reduction. And um, they are also doing a good job of where they do see new cases, really drilling down on those cases to say, was this a preventable case? Could this have been someone that was on PrEP that maybe stopped using PrEP or that never got access to PrEP? How could we have done a better job? So treating these cases as like critical incidents to then inform and feedback to to systems. Obviously, one of the things that you mentioned at the beginning was the challenges that COVID-19 pandemic had on making sure that we kept up to date with the data, but also that people were getting the help that they needed. How are we making sure now that HIV testing continues during emergencies? What plans are in place to make sure that there isn't this lag in information? And how has testing changed since uh, the pandemic? Something interesting that happened uh, because of COVID is that prior to the COVID pandemic, many countries had legal frameworks in place where people couldn't self-test or where testing for HIV was only allowed by a medical provider. And because COVID self-testing obviously needed to happen across Europe and across the world, countries in some cases had to change their legal frameworks to allow COVID self-testing to to be possible. And this had a knockoff effect on other diseases. And we've seen that for HIV. We've seen the number of countries implementing self-testing or community testing by non-healthcare professionals has really increased since the COVID pandemic. So that's positive. And I think, should we find another pandemic? Hopefully we won't. But if we should get into a situation that, um, like we saw in 2020 and 2021, where people are at home or healthcare services are curtailed, there would be more possibilities now in place for home testing, kits to be sent in the mail. Those things are happening now today, and, and that could be expanded on. Okay. Well, my final question today is really about the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. How is Europe doing? I mean, in this conversation, there are a lot of positive things that seem to have happened in the past couple of years. But at the same time, we are seeing the number of cases rise. And obviously, we can't look at that as a positive. So is Europe on track for 2030? So far, the goal that has been set out by UNAIDS and which is linked to the Sustainable Development Goal on Health or the target for HIV is we should see a 90% reduction in new HIV infections from the 2010 baseline to 2030. We have not seen that reduction. We've seen a very slight reduction since 2010, depending a little bit on how you can adjust the data and how we measure these cases, for example, that have transferred care, we wouldn't possibly be able to see more than a 10% reduction so far. We do not seem to be on track in the years that are remaining, seven years to 2030, to possibly reach that 90% reduction. And the things that we're not doing well enough so far are prevention. We know that PrEP works really, really well. There's so many people that are waiting lists that are not receiving PrEP who need it. That would be something easier to do. Still harm reduction for people who inject drugs is not being applied at the scale that it would need to. So more needle and syringe programs and drug treatment. But then also testing, there's still far too long that people are waiting for testing. And so like on average, it's three years between infection and diagnosis. So really trying to make testing much more available to people as we've already discussed. And then finally, putting people on treatment and supporting that they remain on treatment. And so people who have maybe issues of co-diagnosis with mental health or substance abuse, that they're receiving wraparound services that are really person-centered to ensure that they're successfully treated because then they will be healthy, but they'll also not pass on HIV to others. So is something like having this surveillance report come out and being able to sort of see these numbers in in quite stark reality, do you think that will help 
for the next seven years in terms of encouraging more countries to adopt these services? We hope that it does. Um, and we hope also that people can look at their neighbors and say, oh, things are happening there. I mean, recently, for example, Amsterdam just published a paper on their reduction by 90% of new HIV infections in MSM. That's an amazing example. So what are they doing? How could that be applied or maybe adapted to be done in neighboring cities or countries across Europe? So this is the possibility that we have. We can see that it is achievable in some places. And, you know, I think that it that means that it, it could be achievable everywhere. We have a, despite economic difficulties, despite Despite, you know, many, many political difficulties, we have good resources in Europe and we have definitely got the knowledge and there's absolutely the prevention uh, possibilities available. And so there is, um, it is definitely within means to achieve these goals. Well, I think that's a good positive note to end on then. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We hope you found this episode insightful. If you'd like to know more about World AIDS Day, you can find a link to the ECDC World AIDS Day page in the notes of this episode. If you would like to know more about ECDC in general, please visit ecdc.europa.eu or follow us on social media for the latest news.